All right, good afternoon, everyone. This is Brian Fox with uh, GSA, TTS, and 18F. Thank you so much for joining us today at the DevOps Community of Practice uh, event. We'll get going in just another minute, giving everybody an opportunity to jump off meetings and, and uh, join ours. So we'll get going in just another minute. All right, we'll go ahead and get started. Thank you all for joining today. Today we're going to have uh, Chris Lauer with NOAA with their Space Weather Prediction Center out of Boulder, Colorado, sharing with us about their move towards Agile and DevOps. Um, been really looking forward to this one. I think, uh, think you all will enjoy it. Just some logistics first. Uh, this meeting is being recorded. You'll be able to share the content with your colleagues in the future. Um, in just a few days, we'll be able to get that posted up on YouTube uh, so you can share it with anybody else that uh, you believe would be interested in it or for folks that uh, wanted to attend but had a, a calendar conflict. Um, also, we've got upcoming presentations uh, planned out till October 2020, um, and that will continue to march forward, I'm sure. Uh, in fact, next month we'll be uh, going international. Carl Baker with Linz will be presenting on what they've been doing as far as DevOps. And Carl Baker, uh, uh, Linz is the uh, Land Information New Zealand. So it'd be the equivalent in US government uh, of the domestic mapping uh, activity over at USGS. So he's gonna be sharing with us. Um, just a reminder, uh, we are all about sharing what's happening with DevOps across government. Um, these are technical and management lessons, and these can include the successes, as well as the things that you've learned from uh, by pushing Agile and, and DevOps in your particular office. Feel free to put questions in the chat. I'll be using that after the pres presentation to facilitate the Q&A. And don't forget, we've got the listserv. There's the opportunity for the discussion to continue beyond the event uh, and after the event. Um, We've got our web presence. We'll share that in the uh, chat uh, here shortly. And last but not least, also just a request for presentations. If you've got something to share, feel free to email me at brian.fox at gsa.gov. Again, brian.fox at gsa.gov. And we'll go ahead and, and get you on the backlog. Um, uh, there will also be a link uh, to the survey. We always appreciate feedback. Um, otherwise, uh, Peter, anything from you? Uh, sounds like you got it, Brian. All right. All right. Alex, anything from a logistics and comm standpoint? No, thank you, Brian. And thanks, Chris, for joining us. Um, just as a reminder, this is being recorded and, um, you won't be able to unmute yourself. So please direct all questions you have in the chat. And at the end of the presentation, Brian will facilitate a Q&A with Chris. That's all for me, Brian. Cool. Thank you both. Um, otherwise, Chris, over to you. Thank you so much today and looking forward to your presentation. All right. Thank you, Brian. And uh, thanks, everyone, for, for joining us today. Uh, this presentation is, a, as Brian said, about moving our, our journey here from Agile um, into DevOps with a, with a small team. Uh, it's a little bit different than some of the other presentations we've had and that uh, there's, this is what we're doing to make our lives better um, at the bottom of the food chain, uh, so to speak. So without further ado, let's get into it. So first, a little bit about the Space Weather Prediction Center. We're buried pretty deep in the agency bureaucracy. So we're under the Commerce Department and then NOAA's under that, and then Weather Service, National Centers for Environmental, Environmental Prediction, and then uh, SWPSI. Uh, and we 
we can't inherit much agile from our parent agencies. Um, our parent organizations don't aren't really doing it. Uh, and there's not much to steal from DevOps either <laughs> or um, containers or uh, cloud. So we still need to make our lives better. Um, so the, another thing about our position in this bureaucracy is that we have a different subject area that's not quite clearly in common with all of our, our parent agencies. I mean, it's space weather, so it's kind of weather and environmental prediction, but, but the sun is a very different uh, subject matter. We're also considered FISMA high, uh, so they're telling us we can't use the cloud so far. Hopefully that's going to change soon. Um, but so that meant we've had to do everything on premise. Uh, and we do have a really cool mission. So space weather is solar flares, coronal mass ejections, uh, things that the sun is doing that can impact the earth, um, satellites, power grids, aviation, high frequency communication, uh, astronauts. Uh, so it's, it's pretty cool stuff. So first, first thing we did, uh, we adopted Agile. So uh, in order to do that, we sent all of our software developers to Scrum Master Training. So we all knew the rules of how to do Agile Scrum. We found a project that really required Agile, which was our new uh, website, spaceweather.gov. And as much uh, of Agile and creating an environment where you had a team that could work together, we also needed the process to create an organizational consensus because the websites, websites can be pretty contentious. Uh, so we've been doing two-week sprints for about eight years now. We've had different evolutions of team membership and structure. Um, so it's scrums every day, and then uh, weekly backlog refinements. We got our, uh, we, we did reviews for a while, and we stopped doing reviews, and we started again, and we stopped again. That's been a little bit hard to get keep going, but you know, it's the, the scrum method. And uh, part of our culture here is that we're trying to have our developers work as closely with scientists and forecasters as possible to sort of spread the, uh, the teamwork culture. And as we did this, we saw some big improvements in morale on the team on the, of the software developers and in the organizations, um, how they perceived us and, and our capabilities as well. And uh, it was time to improve delivery. So DevOps. But here's the, uh, the challenge. Swipsy's architecture has always been this giant single Microsoft SQL Server production database and you get all the data in that one database. And I, I don't mean server, I mean database. Um, so we had views and stored procedures that were reaching across schemas to combine all sorts of different data into something nice and tidy that the applications could use, but that meant that there was a lot of business logic in the database. And there is no, there is no service layer and applications would reach into the database directly. Um, so you had all this tight coupling there, and then we had crons everywhere, so things weren't very event-driven, and uh, latency is important. So this deep coupling we had was really killing our ability to move quickly. It was killing our agility. And, uh, you know, we'd heard different people doing continuous integration. How were we going to do that with this architecture, with all the challenges of, of getting um, the whole tangled-up database stood up for, for testing? So we started seeking out a new way. We took some Jenkins training and, and some continuous integration training. And we got to see some Docker in that training, and that was really the, the seed from which we built this. Uh, we went out and did some research and labeled our um, what we were doing, our old architectural style, which is called shared database integration. Martin Fowler has some very mean things to say about shared database integration. I can kind of see why. <laughs> uh, I read a book on a new way. I checked out Sam Newman's Building Microservices from the library. Highly recommend it. Uh, really good philosophies in there. And I presented uh, what I read in that book to our other developers, and I got buy-in from our section on trying a, a new way and quite a bit of excitement, which was cool to see. So then we found a small but high value, there's a milestone project, uh, the verification service, which just does uh, forecast verification. So it takes observations of space weather and forecast and sees how you're doing. Uh, so we found a, a small project. We split our team, which was getting a little bit too large, uh, so half the team, less than half the team went off to continue some important database work and the other half got to try this new way. We adopted Slack to improve the communication around this time. And then we went off and developed this new verification service, uh, this high value project with new rules to try to get us towards DevOps. And here are the rules. 
So only one thing, in this case, this, the service, uh, talks to a database. So you still need a database, you still need to store stuff on the back end, but no longer expose that to your applications directly. Everything has to go to the service and make it service oriented. And we leaned a little bit towards micro as we have a lot of different kinds of data that we deal with. So uh, small seemed like a good idea. <clears throat> But we wanted a collection of loosely coupled services that were uh, high, still highly cohesive. You could say they really just did one thing uh, that each solved part of that problem. So hopefully to make us more nimble. And then made that uh, CI or continuous integration friendly. So Jenkins can stand up all these components and all their dependencies in an automated way, drop test data into the ingest process, you know, all the processing happens and then do a query to make sure that you got the results we expected so we could fully automate end-to-end -end testing. And uh, make it event-driven, like at low latency, keep that as keep the latency as low as possible. We didn't really need it for this service, but we knew we needed to learn that soon, so we did. And we uh, followed the rules on 12factor.net as best as we could, especially storing configuration in the environment. That really ended up being the best place to put it. And when we did this, we said, hey, you know, let's also try a bunch of new stuff. So we also learned a lot of NoSQL. We adopted MongoDB for a more uh, developer-friendly database, something you could move much more quickly on. We adopted Python Flask for, for a RESTful service to do gets and posts. Uh, asynchronous messaging, uh, this was the introduction of RabbitMQ into uh, our architecture, so we could have loosely coupled services that talk through messaging and then put everything in a Docker container, manage those dependencies, uh, make sure that all your environments are exactly the same because you're deploying this portable Docker image. That was really critical. So how did it go? Um, this was amazing. This is about two years ago now, I guess. Uh, developers were really excited to learn these contemporary technologies and the pace of learning was, was very rapid. It was impressive. People were pretty excited. Um, iterative changes became much easier. The customer for the verification service was thrilled with what we built. It was way better than he expected, and he was thrilled with how quickly we delivered it. Uh, a little bit of background on that, he was terrified when we told him, hey, we're gonna, we're gonna choose your project to try this new thing. Um, but he was really excited with the results. And we found it was much faster to learn all this new stuff and, and complete this project than it would have been to try to pigeonhole this capability into the old system. But of course, there's things that didn't go as well. Uh, the microservices team, with all that rapid learning, got pretty far ahead of the rest of the organization very quickly. So we lost some of the other software developers. And uh, we, didn't, we weren't able to bring along much of the ops team, the sysadmins and the network. So they didn't really notice that we changed how we were doing everything. Um, the biggest mistake we made probably are continuous integration tests were quickly ignored. Uh, <laughs> we didn't have good alerting. On, on Jenkins, so when a test failed, uh, it wasn't yet posting the Slack, it was emailing a couple developers, but it was easy to miss those emails. Um, so the test would stay broken even though the software was usually working, uh, we just ignored it. And uh, we discovered it was pretty difficult to build a container on a secure network, we did solve that with a pretty obvious solution. But the next steps became more difficult. We didn't have a mature container orchestrator, so we're, we're still deploying with Docker Compose, starting to get container sprawl, where containers are running on multiple hosts. Uh, our, our tests were breaking our agility, as I, as I mentioned. Developers were getting upset with Jenkins because you'd find out that you know, your code change broke the test, but actually the, you know, what, your code was producing stuff that was fine, but the test needed to be fixed. Um, <laughs> a lot of frustration around that. We had a few security failures in pen testing. Our Nagios monitoring as we adopted containers, we had it actually um, use the Docker daemon to, to, to check status and uh, that allowed some privilege escalation, so we had to fix that. And uh, unfortunately, Jenkins was compromised, which uh, there was a dumb mistake there that we were able to lock that down. So we kept iterating on what we can control to make that better. We locked Jenkins down, we changed our Nagios monitoring, no, no longer through the Docker daemon, so use container endpoints and health checks. We got an on-premise Docker image repository. We adopted Harbor, so we're no longer building on staging or production, and that was a huge improvement. I was able to do that in a few hours. <laughs> it's taken some more maintenance, but definitely worth adopting a registry. And we socialized the benefits of containers and continuous integration to scientists and developers, managers, the ops team, um, 
yeah, formal presentations just in the hallway, just always mentioning it because it's really it's a really exciting way to work. And containers quickly became the new way for our team. So it's it was great for managing complicated and conflicting dependencies. It's great for developing locally and, and knowing that your code is going to work in the deployment environment. And it made that deployment really easy. So we, we you know, if we had a bug that somehow made it to production, you could roll it back, fix it, and deploy it, you know, several times per hour if you needed to, <laughs> maybe every minute. And there's some signs of hope for uh, for overcoming some of the other obstacles. Uh, we've delivered some pretty complicated systems to production very quickly using this new model. Uh, so space weather models, we were, we were able to containerize and deploy um, much faster than we were in the past. And the new GOES satellite processing has all been developed this way as we switched to the new uh, GOES 16 and 17 satellites. Our ops team lead, the, the acting manager, asked if we're using Kubernetes. We're not. but that's exciting that he heard the word and wanted to try it here. Our Linux admin is starting to use containerized versions of some of his tools. So, so as he's learning that, that'll really help us out. And we might get some cloud in a year or two. You know, who knows? <laughs> We're hopeful. Um, it'd be a good fit for us. So the, the next steps for us, uh, we got a new rule. We got to have a new rule where all images on staging and production must be built by Jenkins and continuous integration somehow. Um, so right now we're building on our development environments and if we make sure that Jenkins has built them all, that means we have automated tooling in every deployment process. Then you just have to hang tests and security checks and everything off of that uh, part of the pipeline. We need to centralize our container logging as we're getting that container sprawl. It's important to be able to see all those logs in one place. We're looking at Elk, but there's a lot of different solutions there that we could adopt. We need to get an orchestrator. We're experimenting with uh, Docker Enterprise Edition. The ops team might lean more towards Pivotal, Pivotal or VMware. Um, Swarm would probably fit our needs really well, Docker Swarm, but it's, we're finding that that might not um, be a solution that sticks around as it loses out to Kubernetes. Um, we're finding this orchestration choice to be very difficult. Um, we're afraid of vendor lock-in. <laughs> uh, and then you're looking at the cloud and this becomes less of an issue if you went full cloud. And we're gonna to try to containerize as much of our legacy stuff as we can with the RHEL 6 end of life, in part because it's much easier to containerize it and test it than it would be to test it without containerizing it, uh, if that makes sense. And then we just gotta keep pushing on cloud. Our, our developers are pretty frustrated with having to build and maintain so much DevOps tooling and, and database and a lot of things that the cloud uh, can insulate you from that um, complexity just by, you just buy it. Um, so by having to do all this on-prem, it creates a lot of extra overhead. So uh, that's the end of my presentation. It's about 15 minutes. So looking for questions, looking for feedback. Answers would be awesome. Um, but thank you. <laughs> Chris, absolutely. First and foremost, I'm going to thank you because this is uh, just a terrific presentation where you were sharing not just the successes you're seeing, but the pain points you experienced and even next steps you're looking at. So. Uh, uh, kind of a courageous presentation. I sure appreciate it. I'd, I'd like to see more of these uh, in, the, in the future. So thanks for leading the way uh, on that. I sure appreciate it. Um, there are some uh, questions. Um, let's see, uh, Jennifer is wondering uh, how big your team is. Yeah, so when I said we had a two large team, I think we had about 11. At this point, uh, we split it, at the beginning of this present, like kind of when we did the split, it became, I think it was five and four or six and four, something like that. <clears throat> cool. Um, oh, Ken's just got a uh, kind of a funny comment there. It's inconceivable that a weather service doesn't have a cloud. <laughs> <laughs> um, do you want to talk a little bit about some of the... Uh, 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 some of the difficulties in getting cloud, what, what you're hearing from perhaps the, the larger IT enterprise organization? Yeah, so I think there's been a little bit of progress on this. There's a lot of fear of the security part of the cloud. In our case, we're FISMA high because there's, we're only in one place. Um, mm. and, and our mission is important for people that are launching satellites, the power grid, et cetera. So if we were, if we were down, that's uh, it's a pretty big problem. So we're FISMA high for that reason. So it, it makes sense to be able to go cloud and have that geographic distrib distribution, maybe even multi-cloud, so you're really backed up. Um, but the FISMA high designation 
kind of implies that there's sensitive data. Um, <laughs> there's an infrastructure that needs to be protected, but if someone stole all, all of our data, that would be fine. I think that's right. the main sticking point. And then our parent agency has an adopted cloud. So we don't have any templates to steal from. The, the, nobody's really paved the way for us yet. Interesting. Looks like you all are uh, leading from where you're at. So that's a good place to be though. Yeah, so I mean, really, we're trying to make our lives better and, and hoping we can spread some of those successes up eventually. Um, but just spreading it to the ops team right now is the, the tactical goal. Chris, would you mind jumping back about four or five slides? You, you essentially describe, I'm forgetting what it was titled. Uh, go back, go back, keep going. Oh, right before this one, seeking a new way. Yeah. Yep. Can you talk about the timeline there for everyone? Just share, because you talk about 2012, y'all went agile or, or started pushing on that. So when did step number one uh, occur? When did you take that CI training? Uh, CI training was, oh gosh, that must have been, I should have put the timeline on here. I've had two kids, so I've completely lost track of time. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. So, it was a blast. Uh, or, yeah, so it must have been uh, late, I think it was late 2016 we took the CI training. Okay, so all of this has happened then in the last like four years. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So like, uh, so we took the CI training, we got Docker, and then we spent probably six months to a year kind of frustrated that we weren't able to adopt it because of our architecture. So in some of that time, about three months after my second kid was born, I, I was able to read, or after my first kid was born, I was able to read the, the book and, and build up a new way and get past this uh, frustration Got but it. as we built the new verification service under the new rules after doing after getting some buy-in here that that only that was like a two-month project so it was pretty rapid inflection point big change very quickly got it um question here from deval i joined a little late what level access do the developers have and uh with what layer test pp and production Oh yeah, so um, it's it's interesting. So we have two developers that, including myself, that have um, Linux administration skill sets, and we have complete access to, to everything, um, including production. So in general, most of our developers have access all the way to our production system if they need it. Um, <laughs> so pretty deep access. Uh, from Peter, he's got a question there. Uh, FISMA high for open data implies that loss of availability or integrity would be severe or catastrophic. Do you have near 100% uptime constraints or is high more aspirational? Yeah, I think it's, I think it's more aspirational. Um, it's pretty hard on-prem. Like, high availability is expensive and complicated anyway, but um, on-prem is not. On-prem on makes it even harder. So I think it's more aspirational. Like part of the reason we'd like to move to the cloud is I think it would imply better reliability. Like hmm. we'd, we'd have some, like our database isn't really high availability. If it reboots, we get some downtime. Like we need to get away from that. Um, so aspirational, that's the answer to the question. <laughs> Got it. Ken is asking, uh, can you talk about how you socialized containers or containerization to the scientists and the academics there? And uh, just just for the audience, one thing that's interesting about uh, SWPC is it's one of the few instances of operationalized science uh, in government where those scientists are uh, yeah, uh, so, rapidly publishing their information. Anyway, yeah, go ahead. So go ahead. One, one, one thing is we made a, a presentation on what containers are, for, for example. We did that, I think we did that as, as a, now I can't remember whether we used it in our dev sync or in, in a research seminar, but we had a lot, it was very well attended and talked about like the terminology of what the difference is between an image and a container and, and how these things are built and how it's kind of like a VM and kind of like executable and try to get it into something they could understand. Um, show them what a Docker file looks like was part of that presentation, kind of go through how the builds work automatically. And you know, some some people, different people took different things from that presentation, but um, it was a very engaged audience. They were really interested in what we were doing. And then as we got to this ICAO project where we had a few new space weather models we had to do um, very quickly, 
we worked actually directly with those with the the scientists that had been working on the models up to that point and, and engage them in how we were going to break down the different things the model was doing, like getting the data, uh, running the model itself, producing the outputs, handing those off to the web into different, so show them how we broke those into different containers and how they would talk to each other. And, uh, you know, the reliability, the auto restart, it's getting just, one of them we really do, learned a lot of Docker in the process. Um, <laughs> so like we, we just worked very closely every day as we were going through that um, IKO model process and and that that was a uh, <laughs> that was really great because then they left seeing the benefits of the containers also some of the complexity um, but it left them feeling pretty confident that these things were going to be robust in the long so term it sounds like you really got into the details with them yeah and that was a that was a philosophical question early like how much should we let the scientists in on this versus how much should we just wrap it mm -hmm. And um, one of them we wrapped, and one of them we really engaged the scientists, and the other one the scientists actually took the lead on containerizing it. Hmm. Very cool. Any other questions for Chris? Oh, here comes one. Um, this is related to QA process. Um, what is your QA process, and did that require uh, you to shift to test-driven development? Yeah, so uh, oddly enough, we're pretty far behind on on testing here. So a lot of a lot of manual testing, a lot of being you know, careful tiptoeing and um, putting a lot of effort into the pull requests and the code review, <laughs> making sure we didn't introduce any errors. Uh, but we're pretty far behind on unit testing, and we we haven't been able to make that switch towards test driven development or um, maybe behavioral driven development might be what we should target. <laughs> but, uh, so we got a long we got a long way to go there, but having the uh, having the CI in place, hopefully that's somewhere we can hang those lessons as we learn them. Yeah, uh, here comes uh, a question from Andrew, and it's a good one, um, but but I think you highlighted a little bit there of just how far down you are nested within Noah. But here's the question: What support or allies have you found along the way pushing for this stack within Noah? If others were looking for allies or support supporters in their orgs how would you suggest they find it? <clears throat> so uh, it, things I've done, uh, so I'm in, I'm in Boulder and there's a good NOAA building here in Boulder that has a lot of research activity. Uh, so I've been able to, to insinuate myself in some of the Office of Atmospheric Research, which is part of NOAA. They had a cloud working group, so I went to that, made some great, like I wasn't explicitly invited, but I saw it on the calendar somewhere and I went, made some great uh, contacts, got to see what they were doing and, and what they were struggling with. For them, it's a lot of high performance computing and how do we, how do we let our parent agency do the cloud? Um, but it was really good to see those common frustrations <laughs> with just not being able to do the, what looks like a pretty obvious solution to a, a problem that's been around for so long. Um, there's this group. Uh, you definitely know some people from this group. Uh, I joined the NOAA mentoring program. Uh, so I was a mentor last year and I was able to make some contacts and in, in fisheries that way, which was, which was pretty cool. Um, it's, it's pretty hard beyond that, <laughs> but, uh, bring it up with any of my other technical contacts occasionally and see if anybody bites on it. Like, uh, we had a request to change some data flow and I just asked if they were thinking about containers or not. Um, so <laughs> if they were, then we could, we could start to talk about that and what we should do moving forward. But. I think they're just so busy up there that they're having a hard time thinking about the next step, you know? <laughs> Absolutely, Chris. Um, next question from Marcus. Uh, can you suggest ways to bring never agilers into the fold? Uh, uh, I guess kind of the naysayers. <laughs> well, something really striking there is from, uh, I don't know if you know this guy, Brian Fox, he did a talk at Mile High Agile. Uh, that was your talk. He talked about being really compassionate <laughs> to the people as you're going through this organizational change and trying to adopt Agile. And understanding that when people are really upset about the change and really angry, that there's there's probably something behind that. And you need to keep asking questions and to be compassionate towards their perspective and understand the struggle um, from their perspective to understand the new way. Uh, it's pretty hard with developers that don't want to work Agile. Um, we have a few that we weren't able to bring along in the change. And uh, that's still, a, that's still a, kind of an open question. 
But uh, if, you, if you're able to be successful, and you're able to uh, impress your management or your organization um, with how much better it is, how much better delivery is and capability, um, then ultimately you'll kind of win the war just by being effective and get a lot of clout from being able to deliver. Chris, absolutely. And I sure appreciate you uh, presenting today and answering all these uh, questions. We have run out of time. Uh, so uh, y'all can go ahead and feel free to uh, fill out the feedback. We sure appreciate that. I'm sure there's other questions and you may want to know more details uh, from Chris. Uh, feel free to uh, just go into the listserv uh, and go there. Chris, you're in the listserv, correct? Yes. All right. Let's, let's uh, continue the conversation there. Um, and uh, next month, uh, Carl Baker from the Land Information New Zealand will be presenting, um, which will be a lot of fun hearing from a uh, Commonwealth partner. So um, thank you all again, uh, and have a wonderful day. Thank you.